Hello everybody and welcome back to the show. First of all, I'd like to say thank you guys for the suggestions um, and for the really great comments people leave on the videos. I really appreciate that. And uh, I think I'm almost at like a thousand subscribers now. And I know I don't mention that in the videos because I don't super care about that like some YouTube personalities do. Um, but it shows me that you guys care and you like what I'm doing. So I will continue to do what I'm doing. I also met a fan of the show at an Enter the Haggis concert recently. If you haven't heard of Enter the Haggis, you should check them out because they're amazing. I'll put a link over here so you can listen to their music. They used to be this like Celtic rock band and now they're more of a folk rock band. Um, but they're really fun, you should check them out. My number one most requested video, number one, is probably the one-handed roll. I get maybe an email a week requesting a video to break down the one-handed roll. So I thought, hey, you know what? Let's make it happen, all right? So before we get started though, I decided I'm going to start putting a link down at the bottom of the videos where you can go to the website and that's where you can find the PDFs of the exercises to download and print at home. A lot of people email me and they're like, hey, where can I find that stuff? Well, you could go to marinbiology.com, but to make things just a little bit easier, I'll put a link down there so you can check it out. So what is a one-handed roll? Well, I mean, simply speaking, it's playing a roll with one hand, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because we start out playing marimba doing something called the alternating stroke. And the alternating stroke is basically two independent strokes where you just hit one mallet and then the other. So notice how one mallet goes down and then comes back up before the other one goes down. In a one-handed roll, it's more of a teeter-totter or seesaw motion where one goes down and the other one comes up. Now the funny thing about this is that that motion is actually more natural for us and when beginners start playing and they try to do alternating strokes, they end up doing the teeter tartar motion instead because it's a little bit more natural motion for the hands. And then we beat that out of ourselves and it's like, no, we will do alternating strokes. Arr! And then when we want to learn the one-handed roll, it's difficult for us when that's what our hands wanted to do in the first place which is kind of funny, but no need to fear. I have some exercises that are gonna help you uh, transition from going between alternating strokes and an independent roll. Our first exercise is called torque. Basically, you get to a nice comfortable interval of a fifth or so, you put on the metronome at 60 to 70 beats per minute, and you go back and forth with 16th notes. The trick though, is that you start super quiet and then gradually crescendo. The purpose of this exercise is to build torque and flexibility, so get as loud as you possibly can, even if it looks and sounds a little bit sloppy. I don't have my metronome with me today, so we're going to try to feel this out, but this is what the exercise looks like. What I like about this exercise is that it builds control and flexibility, and that's the main purpose. The main purpose isn't for it to sound like totally perfect, um, but it's to build up that range of motion that you need to be able to have enough control to play these things and have it sound good. The most important thing when playing this exercise is to go slow and go big. Even if you miss a note or even if it's a little sloppy, it doesn't matter, go slow and go big. Now you'll notice when you go to an octave, um, that you're actually going to have too much power. You have an enormous amount of torque at an octave and the, the difficult thing is going to be to control it so that it doesn't sound really sloppy or really lopsided, like one mallet being a lot louder than the other. So with the octave, it's especially important to start very, very soft. Now when you go to a third, the difficulty there is, of course, is you're going to be feeling like you're doing a whole lot of work and not a lot of volume is coming out. And that's just the nature of a small interval. Um, but still work on it. Try to get as much range of motion as you can. Try to get it as loud as you possibly can. And you will slowly build up that strength. 
Now it should be noted that while you can do this at an interval of a second, that's not totally practical. Um, in fact, you're almost never going to do an independent roll with your mouths this close together. And we'll get more into that in just a minute. The next exercise is called endurance. It's designed to build endurance and speed while keeping the dynamic level the same. It's loosely based off an old SCV exercise. Here you gradually add more and more rotations until you're doing an all out roll. The important thing to keep in mind with this exercise is to start slow and make sure that your mounts are very even. Make sure that the rhythm is very even. A lot of people kind of get into this swing rhythm when they try to do rolls too fast. So go slow enough that you're keeping those 16th notes very straight. We need to have a specific discussion about small intervals. McKenzie writes, I roll at a fifth or higher without too much difficulty, but in either hand when I get down to a third or the dreaded second, the outside mallet intermittently touches my index finger. I've tried loosening my grip on the outer mallet in order to bring the shafts downward, but it hasn't helped much. I also have difficulty with getting much motion out of the inner mallet at low intervals. Okay, at a smaller interval, you're going to have less power, and at the interval of a third, uh, this shaft might might hit your finger just a little bit, and that's that's totally normal. Um, but the reason why I said earlier that you don't normally do these things at a second, like with your mouths together or at a third, is because it gives you almost no control. So what you want to do is use the mighty power of positioning to actually hold your mouths at a wider interval while playing the third or the second, and that way you can still get a good roll. Uh, for example. Here is an interval of a second. I'm gonna to try to do a one-handed roll on a C and D and, and try to make this happen. Here we go. Okay, so that wasn't too bad, but I mean, that's about as loud as I could do it. I, I have virtually no levels of expression with that whatsoever. Uh, so instead of holding my mouths here, I'm actually gonna hold them at a third or even a fourth and position myself so that the mallets are farther apart. And now when I roll in the second, I'm gonna have plenty of volume and plenty of control. The same thing applies to rolling on one note. You know, you typically don't wanna do this, although I've seen a couple people do this successfully. Uh, I wouldn't try to do a roll on one note with my mallet heads together. That's a little goofy. So instead, you want to get them as far apart as you can um, and, and, and still be able to hit good playing zones. So I'm on the edge with this mallet and a little bit off center on the upper side of the bar with this mallet. And that's about a fourth, so I'm going to have plenty of volume and control here. Now with these one-handed rolls, you are bound to come into some positional difficulties when trying to achieve them. For example, if you want to roll uh, an E-flat major chord, say voiced like this. For double verticals, I'm just using my normal playing zones, uh, and it sounds fine, and it feels totally comfortable. The problem is, if I want to do an independent roll here, um, if you notice in my right hand, and, and we've talked about this before, my inside mallet is in line with my arm in this position. And if a mallet is in line with your arm, be it the inside mallet, or if I twist this way, now it's the outside mallet, it's going to have almost no torque whatsoever. So if I'm in this position and I start doing a roll, this G is going to be super loud and this E flat is going to have almost no volume whatsoever.
So you may want that, but I think in this case it looks a little goofy. So we're gonna use positioning. So instead of this right here, we're gonna change our playing zones just a little bit in our arm position to try to get the mouths to split the difference of the arm instead of being in line with the arm. So instead of maybe being right here, I'll play in the middle of these bars and that'll allow me a chance to move over a little bit. So now I'm gonna have a lot more control over this hand and this E flat should be a little bit louder. Now while you're working on these things, you are bound to get tired. Your muscles are gonna start burning like crazy. You might try to go too fast. You might start putting the death grip on the mallets. And the more tense you are, the slower you're going to go and the more frustrated you're going to get. Blaze writes, Dear Marimbology, I am currently trying to develop my one-handed roll using two mallets and one hand. However, as I try to speed up the roll, I feel pain and tension in my hands. What can I do to reduce the pain so I can obtain a nice and fast one-handed roll? Sincerely, Blaze. First of all, Blaze, 10 points for having an awesome name. Uh, second of all, do the, uh, the exercise torque and go slow and big. And that'll allow your muscles to really relax and get that full range of motion. Uh, in fact, when I see people do these and they're experiencing a lot of pain and a lot of tension, it's because they're trying to go like at mind blowing speeds. Like they try to get on there and they're, I don't know if I can demonstrate this, but they try to do something like this. And they're just tension up their arm and it, and it looks awful. I mean, it's better to have a slow, even roll than a fast, awful roll. Okay, I'd much rather hear this. than something like this. So take a lot of breaks, go slow, and that should help you out. Make sure you're not squeezing those mouths too tight with your fingers. It should be nice and relaxed. The tighter you squeeze, the slower you're gonna go. And you can demonstrate this with a snare drum stick. If you take a snare drum stick, grip it as hard as you possibly can with your fingers, and then try to play real fast, you'll be hitting eighth notes at like quarter note equals 80. Okay, so in order to go fast on snare drum and on marimba, you have to have those muscles loose only use enough pressure that the mallet isn't going to fly out of your hand. All right, now I'm gonna demonstrate a few pieces for you that kind of illustrate how you would use these things in practice. I'm gonna start out with a piece by Annie Harnsberger uh, called Words Unspoken. It's one of my favorite marimba pieces ever, but it's kind of like the holy grail of the one-handed roll because uh, it has a lot of them and a lot of hand-to-hand -hand switching and just craziness. In fact, it starts out with this left-handed roll on A flat Sorry if I'm, I'm going off screen, but the room isn't big enough for this piece. <laughs> and you're hitting all these high notes up here, and then you're switching hands, and then doing low notes here, and then you're switching hands again. It's just kind of ridiculous. So I'm gonna use the mighty power of positioning as I start this first roll, because by default, uh, my inner mallet is in line with my arm, and that's gonna make a very, very awful roll when I try to start this piece. It's gonna sound like this. Okay, the outer mallet's way louder than the inner mallet. So I'm gonna play as much, uh, split my mallets as much as I can to get that a little bit more even, and that way when I play the piece, it should sound a little bit better. Here we go, here's words unspoken. And for the next example is a middle excerpt from Dr. Gratis Ad Parnassum by Debussy. There's a lot of arrangements of this, but almost all of them use some sort of one-handed roll in the middle section, and oftentimes crossing over hands. So here's my take on that section.
All right, everybody, I hope this has been helpful to you. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, send them to marimbology at gmail.com. Please be sure to check the links over here to go to the website and download the exercises and check out just general information about the marimba. And I'll see you guys next time.